This video begins Unit 2 on Biochemistry, Learning Targets 1 through 3 on Basic Biochemistry. We begin by talking about elements. <clears throat> elements for years uh, were considered by scientists of the day that earth, fire, air, and water, they would burn a piece of wood and of course the air, the smoke would come out of it and it would turn to earth and of course fire is coming out of it and then the sap drips and that's the water and they would look at that and they would think well all of those things make up the wood. Well since then we've learned that things are much more complicated. An element is a substance that is made up of one type of atom. Here's a piece of gold. Gold is only made up of gold and the, so a gold the element gold is only made of gold. The element oxygen is only made of oxygen. Those are one kind of atom. What is an atom? Well, an atom is the basic uh, unit of matter. It is made up of subatomic particles, electrons, which are negatively charged, protons, positively charged, and neutrons, which have no charge. We chart our elements on something called a periodic table. The periodic table is a way to organize known elements into groups and <clears throat> these different groups can be seen vertically here and horizontally. Everything means something. It's not just a random distribution. Uh, we won't be going too much into the distribution here on the periodic table other than to note a few things, but a periodic table does have a very significant use in uh, determining uh, what type of atoms we're dealing with and so forth. Now as we begin talking about the periodic table there are a couple numbers that I want us to note and one of them is the atomic number. You can see that there in the upper right hand corner of this uh, periodic table, the numbers there. On our periodic table in the room it's in the upper right hand corner in blue as well. And the atomic number notes the number of protons that are in a given atom. The number of protons decide what type of atom it is. A carbon atom has six protons. There is no such thing as a carbon atom that has seven protons. An atom with seven protons is nitrogen. And so this does not change. This determines the element. The mass number is the number that is underneath the element and it's also called the atomic mass. And this is the mass of the element so uh, with the protons plus the neutrons added in and as well as the electrons. Since electrons are really small, they don't contribute to the mass much. And so you can typically find the number of neutrons in an atom by subtracting the atomic mass from the, uh, subtracting the number of protons from the atomic mass. And in this case, the number of neutrons in chlorine would be 18. Now this is just a note on neutrons. Neutrons are neutral. They do not have a charge. It's not correct to say they have a neutral charge. It's just better to say they have no charge, but they do take up space and they do actually determine things. And one of those things is isotopes. <coughs> An element has a particular number of neutrons. Uh, helium, for instance, has two protons, two neutrons. However, if you were to add neutrons to helium, you would have an isotope of helium. An isotope is just an atom of an element that has a different number of neutrons. Isotopes differ in neutrons only, not protons, not electrons. Isotopes differ in neutrons only. Sometimes isotopes are unstable and their rate of decay is usually constant. This is radioactive decay. You've heard of that. And so you, we can use this rate of constant decay in order to date materials. Carbon-14 is a good example of this. You can test the, the amount of carbon-14 left in living things, and that will give you a possible, you know, approximate date as to how old that is. And this is used in all sorts of, uh, in all sorts of uh, scientific endeavors. As we talk about electrons, it gets a little bit more complicated. Electrons uh, are negatively charged uh, subatomic particles. And the number of electrons in an uncharged atom is always equal to the number of protons. One thing that I want to point out here that I didn't mention earlier is that in any particular atom, 
you have the electrons and they're out here and they're kind of swimming around in this electron cloud is what that's called and then there in the middle you have what's called the nucleus of the atom and this is going to be where your protons and neutrons are located the electrons are always floating around outside of the nucleus now the electrons are going very fast and that's why they call this an electron cloud because it's hard to pinpoint where they are at any one time and one thing about electrons is the rate at which an electron is spinning around the nucleus will be indicative of the amount of energy that it has so if you're shining a light let's say you have a like a high intensity light and you're shining it on a piece of iron well, you can come back and fill that piece of iron in a couple of hours and it will be very hot. The reason that it feels hot is because it has a lot of energy. The electrons are spinning at a very rapid rate and it causes them to go away from the nucleus. To move out away from the nucleus. Similar to spinning something around your head in a circle. It wants to, wants to fly away. That, that force is forcing it away from you. Conversely, if you were to spin it very slowly, it would want to get closer to you. And so as electrons lose energy, they will actually move in closer to the nucleus. Now, what does this, what does this have to do with anything? Well, first of all, there are a certain amount of electrons in the outer shell of every atom <clears throat> because electrons exist in, in these shells on an atom. And not to get into that too much, but there are, there's always the outer shell, the outermost shell of an atom. And the electrons that exist in that outermost shell are called valence electrons. And these valence electrons are important because these are the electrons that an atom will readily lose when it gets to a certain amount of energy. Now what happens to those atoms that lose electrons or gain electrons, as it were? They become ions. An ion is an atom with a positive or negative charge. If it's a positive charge, what has happened? Well, let's look here at the sodium side here. Well, 11 protons, 11 electrons. Everything's nice and nice and normal. 11 pluses, 11 minuses, charge zero. But if we lose an electron, let's say this atom gets a lot of energy, loses an electron, all of a sudden, we have a positive charge. And so a sodium, atom, a sodium atom will readily lose that outside electron and, and it will have a positive charge. And we write, because sodium is Na, we would write it like this, Na+. plus. You'll see that a lot. Well, chlorine is the opposite. Chlorine has a rather full outer shell and it has one space that is open. And so whereas chlorine is typically 17 pluses, 17 minuses, it will readily pick up that other electron. What's that going to cause to happen? Well, it's going to have a net negative charge, and so we will write something like that. This is why chlorine and sodium like one another so much. They readily join with one another because of this charge, positive and negative, always like one another. Now, a few more terms. First is molecules. A molecule is formed when two atoms join together chemically. Hydrogen and oxygen join together to make water. Nitrogen and hydrogen, ammonia, carbon and, and you, you get this, methane, so forth. Two oxygen atoms join together to make O2, which is molecular oxygen. Now this is going to be a little different from a compound. So I don't have a, a slide for that. A compound is formed when at least two different atoms join together. So water is a compound because oxygen and hydrogen are different, but O2 is not a compound because oxygen and oxygen are the same. So let's talk a little bit about energy, potential versus kinetic energy. Potential energy is energy that is stored up, and kinetic energy is energy that has been released or is energy that's moving. What does this have to do with biochemistry? Well, chemical bonds represent potential energy. So we'll, this is a chemical bond, and 
these are chemical bonds, and each one of these lines are chemical bonds. And this is a molecule of ATP, which you've probably heard of, and ATP is where we get our energy in our body. And this particular bond right here is where all the energy comes from in ATP. When that bond breaks, what was once potential energy here is now released, and that energy becomes kinetic. And so chemical bonds equal stored energy. It takes energy to create those bonds, which is why when you break them, you get that energy back out. Different types of bonds have varying amounts of energy stored in them. The stronger the bond, the more energy needed to break that bond. So let's talk about chemical bonds. The first type of <coughs> chemical bond is a covalent bond. And this is when two or more atoms are sharing electrons. Covalent bonds means sharing electrons. Co, like they cooperate, you're sharing the work, cooperating. And so sharing is covalent. Well, there's another word that we saw earlier, right? Valent. It's the valence electrons. They're sharing the outside electrons. Look here at this picture. Oxygen has one space available. Well, it just so happens that hydrogen has one lone electron. Hydrogen will do this. Oxygen will do this. And it will readily, they'll readily share those electrons, forming a very strong bond, H2O. Those two, those two hydrogens are strongly bonded to the oxygen. Now, with some types of bonds, and we'll talk more about this when we talk about water in particular, but with some types of bonds, this causes an unequal sharing of those electrons. And with water in particular, this is where you have this word polar covalent, which we'll talk more about later. As in now. And so the water molecule has eight protons. protons and each hydrogen only has one proton all right so let me actually instead of drawing the eight I'm gonna draw a bunch of pluses so and then down here are the positives so let's say that I had 10 electrons which is the, the total that a water molecule has because the eight uh, the oxygen has eight and the two hydrogens have one each and knowing that knowing that uh, negative and positive are highly attracted to one another what do you think would happen if I just took these electrons and kind of grabbed them and just tossed them randomly at this water molecule what do you suppose would happen? Would they evenly distribute themselves among the positives? No, they wouldn't. Because look what's happening here. Where is the biggest amount of positive in this molecule? Right here. There's very little down here and down here. The biggest amount is right here. And so if I take those 10 electrons and I put them onto this water molecule, they're going to be hanging out around the oxygen a lot more frequently than they're going to be hanging out near the hydrogens. And so what that causes to occur is the oxygen end of a water molecule is slightly negative, and the hydrogen end becomes slightly positive. Why is that? Well, electrons are negative. And so if they're up here, more than they are down here, this end is going to be slightly negative, and this end is going to be slightly positive. That is polarity. Next is an ionic bond. This is the second strongest type of bond that we'll talk about. We talked about ions. <coughs> we talked about ions earlier, and this is where you have a positive ion and a negative ion that connect to one another. They do not share this electron, but they transfer it back and forth. Sodium gives it the chlorine and takes it back. Gives it the chlorine, 
then takes it back. And there's this constant transferring of this electron. So it's a little bit weaker bond than the covalent bond. And what that causes to happen when these uh, ions ions are dry when they're not being they're not being dissolved in water is they'll form crystals like a salt crystal sodium chloride is is table salt and so they will form these crystalline structures like you see here this is lithium and chloride it's the same idea and they form these crystals but when you put water in them they dissolve well why do they dissolve well remember in water let me draw a little water molecule here Water is slightly negative on the hydrogen, on the oxygen end, slightly positive on the hydrogen end. And so those negatives and positives interact with those ions and it causes the salt to dissolve. This is why salt and sugar and those types of things dissolve in water. Next type of bond is the hydrogen bond. And the hydrogen bond plays directly off of those polar forces in a water molecule. Notice. Zoom in a little bit. Notice here's this uh, a water molecule, oxygen and hydrogens. Where's the negative? Here's the negative, because that's where the electrons are most of the time. It's positive up here. Well, if you take this other water molecule down here, negative, positive, look what's happening. There's this magnetic attraction between those two water molecules. There's not an actual bond that's occurring like we have between the for instance between these two mole these two atoms but there's just a magnetic attraction like the attraction of the refrigerator magnet on your on your fridge you can easily pull that off it doesn't require a lot of energy like it would to pull the handle off the refrigerator door that's a stronger type of bond but it is a bond and it does stick the hydrogen bond is the most important bonds in living systems your DNA, your DNA is two-stranded. It is kept together by hydrogen bonds. It doesn't take a lot of energy to separate. That's good because every time you make a cell, your whole DNA needs to separate from one another in order to replicate. But it, it is stuck together well enough that it doesn't just kind of randomly migrate around your cell. And so hydrogen bonds, very important. We'll talk a lot more about hydrogen bonds as the year progresses. And the last type of force that we're going to be looking at are called Van der Waals forces. And Van der Waals forces are slight attractions between oppositely charged regions of larger molecules. So here we have so here we have a large molecule, and we have another large molecule. Well, what's going on? When they get close to one another, all the negatives notice I mean negatives don't like negatives. And so if the negatives are here and the negatives are here, what's going to happen? Well, on one of them, they're actually going to shift to the other side. And the positives are going to go to that side. And there's going to be a slight attraction. Very slight. This is the type of attraction that an enzyme has with its substrate or that proteins have with one another, temporary types of attractions. All right, and so this is the weakest interaction that two molecules can have. As a, and so if you go back to that order that we talked about, covalent was first, strongest, ionic, hydrogen bonds, and then the van der Waals forces represent the weakest kinds of forces.